Well, the World Drugs Day is in a few days. 26th of June is when it is going to be celebrated or at least commemorated. And we have with us Mr. Dr. Oliver Stolpe, who is the country representative of the United Nations Office on Drug and Crime with us in the studio. Mr. Stolpe, welcome to Sunrise Daily. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Pretty grim statistics that we have seen uh, for Nigeria, at least over 14 million uh, drug abusers in the country. I don't want to say users. Uh, there's drug use and there's drug abuse. And I'm sure that that's what you're concerned about, the abuse of drugs and also um, the fact that Nigeria used to be a transit nation. I don't know if we're now, it would seem that increasingly we're graduating to a user nation. Um, unlike before that we used to be known as a transit route. What are your thoughts? What, what are the UN Odyssey's greatest concerns with Nigeria, especially with drug abuse? Hard to pinpoint it to one specific concern. We are in general concerned about the sheer number of drug users that we have in this country, about three times the global average. And we are severely concerned about the insufficient access to quality treatment and counseling, which of course many of them would need in order to deal with the health condition of drug use. And we are concerned about the projections because presently, merely due to the population demographic developments, we are estimating that in only eight years, nine, eight years from now, the population of drug users will have been increased by 40%. So that would mean for Nigeria, for example, in Africa, that would mean for Nigeria that we would have around 20 million drug users. And we're already at this stage having a hard time responding to their health needs, responding to their drug counseling needs, giving them the necessary access. And we should also not forget that this is affecting men and women in a very different way. So men comparatively have much easier access to treatment. Just to give you an idea, one in four drug users is a woman, so roughly a quarter, while only one in 20 persons in treatment is a female. So there's a huge, basically, problem of access to quality treatment and, and counseling for women in particular. I'm really concerned. When you say that Nigeria has three times the world average, that's a disturbing figure. Um, but even more disturbing is the fact that we don't seem to be all agreed on the dangers of some of these drugs. If you were to go, for instance, I know that in recent times there's been a huge crackdown um, on the part of the NDLEA, which is the body of Nigeria, uh, the, gov the arm of government or will I say the institution of government saddled with the responsibility of, you know, ensuring drug control in Nigeria, especially illegal drugs. And uh, there's been a huge crackdown. Only yesterday, a medical doctor uh, was arrested, you know, selling cookies laced with cannabis. Mm. Um, uh, and there were, if you read, if you were to read the comments beneath that particular story. For a number of young people, they saw absolutely nothing wrong with it. So if we're seeing increasingly, and we're suspecting that our figures are going to go up by as much as 40%, what we're trying to do now is raise awareness, tell people that, you know, this is not good. Um, how much work do you think we need to do with changing perceptions, especially with how drug use or what is being classified as recreational drugs and what is being classified as real hard drugs. You know, as this, as the lines seem to be shifting, how do you think we're going to be affecting perception and discouraging people from drug use? That's a very good question. I wish I had a, an equally good answer. Um, the truth is that the specificities of drug use in Nigeria are very complex and are very complex exactly also from that perspective of how do we actually address the preventive aspect, um, the preventive intervention, especially in schools, but also how to reach out of school children, for example. 
And the reason is exactly also linked to the type of drug use that we're seeing. Mm. Cannabis. I'm going to have to take a break at this point, so sorry about that. No I'll let you finish your thoughts. Please hold them, and then we'll come back after this break. Please stay with us. But some of the issues we're considering as the world is going to be celebrating World Drugs Day on the 26th of June, Dr. Oliver Stolpe, country representative of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, is here with us in the studio. And you're just about to answer that question, you know, which also borders relatively on um, the relationship between money and saving lives and recreational use of drugs and how to change the perception of people. Right. Yes, as I was about to say, changing perception of people is quite complex, especially in Nigeria at the present moment, because we have on the one hand a very, very extensive cannabis use, about 10.6 million, as we heard before, and the second most used uh, type of drug are pharmaceutical opioids like codeine, cough syrups, and uh, tramadol. So... All of these are not your typical hard drugs in the sense of cocaine or heroin. So that already in itself makes it a little bit more difficult to communicate effectively, especially with the young population, about the health-related dangers that are undoubtedly there. The second issue that is a worldwide issue, and we're going to be launching tomorrow the World Drug Report, which will place specific attention on this issue, is that cannabis, in terms of its strength, its potency, has quadrupled in the past years. But regardless of that, actually, the perceptions of the danger and the health implications of the use of cannabis, especially the prolonged use of cannabis, have been going down. So we have these kind of contradictions at the moment, and they are very much at play in Nigeria, where people often use pharmaceutical products, which of course in, in many circumstances are actually healthy for you, and cannabis, which is generally considered less and less dangerous, less dangerous than it actually is. And to intervene in that space is, is, is quite a challenge, I fully agree. What are some of the, I, I do not know if there are other examples of countries who are, have had this sort of challenge at some point or another, uh, and maybe developed a template. What are some of the templates that you might have seen uh, have been at work in other places? Do you think uh, perhaps uh, I, we'll soon get to the, the conversation of, you know, the, the cannabis market, the fact that there is also a medical use for mm -hmm. cannabis and that there are some states in Nigeria, particularly Ondo State, uh, which is thinking that we need to tap into that market for the resources. Uh, but looking at the general template, which you, the general situation which you've already described and the, the particular problem, uh, which is peculiar to us, do you think that there is anywhere we can copy a template from or an example we can learn from in terms of how to intervene, considering the fact that we have a real youth bulge? Right. What we are promoting very strongly, and that is really um, consensus international good practice at the level of the General Assembly, is the so-called balanced approach. Basically a tripod which has a strong enforcement, strong treatment and counseling and aftercare, and strong prevention. All of the legs of that tripod need to be equally long, equally well resourced, and equally seriously pursued by government. The Nigerian government and actually all the relevant Nigerian stakeholders, which involve a lot of NGOs and non other non-state actors, the entire health community, for example, have been extremely busy over the past 18 to 24 months in developing the new National Drug Control Master Plan. And that is exactly a translation of that general approach, that philosophy of the balanced approach into a concrete plan of action for the years 2021 to 2025. And we're very much looking forward that in a few days from now, on the 26th, His Excellency uh, President Buhari is hopefully going to be launching that um, master plan. And I think it will give us that blueprint to move forward in a more coherent uh, and convincing and effective way. What are your thoughts when... when 
a number of countries begin to legalize cannabis when there is recreational cannabis. What has been the, the stance of the UNODC on that? Well, first of all, we are not the policy-making body. We are an implementer of the policy that are being determined by member states. But for now, the situation is very clear. We have three drug conventions which are regulating, essentially, um, this entire space. And under this convention, legalizing for recreational use is simply not possible. There are countries that have done so, and they have essentially opted out of certain provisions of that convention and are not presently meeting their, uh, their legal obligations under those conventions. It's a completely different issue of discussing the legalization of production of cannabis for medical or scientific purposes. That is possible. So first of all, I think that distinction needs to be made very clear to the public at present because I'm not sure it is entirely clear. And secondly, we need to think very carefully about taking such a massive step. I think we have heard the NELA chairman who has been very adamant at raising concerns about this proposal. I would say that certainly at the moment when we are seeing already in related areas, for example, the regulation and control of pharmaceutical opioids, huge gaps in terms of how easy it is to access them, how difficult it is the state finds it to control all these semi-formal and informal markets, that maybe essentially creating a situation for cannabis where we might face similar regulatory challenges is not necessarily the right moment. Mm. Well, it's going to be a real tricky one because some people say, in any case, we already have the problem. Mm. The problem is there. The farms are there. The amount of uh, cannabis alone, which uh, NDLEA has seized in the last number of months, I mean, over 2 million uh, kilograms of cannabis alone, uh, some people will say instead of burning it, assuming we had an industry where we converted some of that to, you know, for pharmaceutical use, it, it could have brought some needed revenue. How do you think a country like Nigeria, which is struggling with revenue and also which has a non-drug problem um, and, you know, their fears that that could also be what is fueling the violence, which is seen in different parts of the country. How do you think... A country like Nigeria can strike the balance? Well, we should not be myopic in the sense of the economic impact. Yes, there might be short-term gains to be made, or mid-term gains, I should rather say, because short-term, you cannot just take seized cannabis and sell it because it hasn't medical quality to be sold. It hasn't been grown in the asserted manners that medical cannabis needs to be grown in. Um, but even that aside, I think we need to be very clear that the revenue issue is only one part of the story. The other part of the story is who is using drugs presently and what socioeconomic impact that has on themselves and their families. We're looking essentially at the most predominant use in the age group 25 to 39. These are people who should be productive. These are people often using all sorts of drugs for coping mechanisms. But that, those coping mechanisms also have the side effect that they are slowing themselves down. They are less motivated. We have the statistics for that. About 71% of the drug users that we interviewed for the 2018 drug use um, survey responded that they had missed out in work or had missed out in school or had actually suffered negative consequences, including losing work or dropping out of school. So there is a huge economic impact of massive drug use as we see it right now. And we should not be looking only at the short-term revenue gain, but we should be also looking at it. Do we have the system to reduce the so-called recreational use of drugs the non-medical use of pharmaceutical opioids, the use of cannabis, heroin, and cocaine, that it has presently, and it also including in economic terms. Mm. 
it's a very tricky one. How has the message of prevention been received in schools? I don't know if you've been involved in any schools campaign, but um, I don't know what the general opinion or some of the opinion you have been able to curate from, say, interventions in schools have been. They have been really excellent. And uh, we're, this is one of the part of our program which I personally care most uh, for. It's a school-based prevention program called Unplugged. We have rolled it out in about 100 or so government colleges, federal government colleges. We are now working with a number of states actually doing the same at secondary school level in um, state-owned schools. And the impact has been absolutely encouraging. So first of all, it's a life skill program. So we're not just trying to talk to youth about drugs and the negative impacts, because sorry to say so, that is often a method that doesn't really work. What you need to give youth is basically the basic emotional tools, the um, emotional intelligence, the life skills, the skill of how to do, uh, deal with pressure, how to do with group dynamics, how to do with stress at home or in school, in order to be able to become more resilient essentially to taking drugs and even if they do take drugs to do it in a more conscious way so that they are actually avoiding addiction. So there is a lot of positive response and actually in the schools where the program has been running out, not only we have seen a delayed initiation to the use of drugs, we have also seen a greater readiness of pupil caring for each other and involving counselors at schools when they observe drug use issues and in general which is of course a nice side effect academic performance has been uh, improving in those schools as well so the teachers have been extremely positive about it about 600 uh, trained teachers in deploying this unplugged program and we're now working uh, with the presidency under a program called at risk children uh, that has been launched uh, very recently, to now look also at the out-of-school children. Because obviously we can't reach them in the classroom, so we reach, need to reach them otherwise. And we have identified sports as the vehicle to do so. So we will try to develop this program. We have already been running this program in South Africa and Brazil, and now we are getting ready to do the same in, in Nigeria. Well, the approach is very interesting. It's a totally different approach from what I learned. <laughs> and it will be very interesting to see how that is working. But let me quickly flip this now. Perhaps my colleagues have questions. Gentlemen. Yeah. Um, I mean, listening to uh, some of what you said, uh, said now, are there, what did you identify or notice about, because there are people who we've approached, but um, they rather not talk about it. Uh, it could be parents sharing certain things with their words. How significant is that part? Did you notice, and to what degree, uh, persons who are in denial, and how significant do we address that such that we also contribute to improving all of the statistics? Right. Now, the issue of stigma that you're basically addressing in your question is, is, is very important. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's particularly important for women and girls. They seem to be suffering far more from stigma coming forward, being honest about their drug use issue, being ready to access actually a, a treatment center. Just imagine even the mere fact of taking public transport to the other part of town to enter a drug treatment center that is identified as such might be impossible for many um, of the women and girls in, 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 in Nigeria. And that affects especially women and girls in the north, I would say, um, because there some of these um, stigma factors are more at, uh, at, 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 at uh, operation, so to speak, than what we see in, in the South. But regardless of that, stigma is in general a big problem for drug users to come forward. It prevents them from accessing help. It prevents them from getting information. And we are trying very hard to work with a 
group of NGOs in the setup of drug treatment centers. We've also helped, and I'm extremely pleased about that, with the creation of a drug helpline, which actually gives the opportunity to call help in the privacy of your room. So you're avoiding some of those uh, dynamics of stigma. And that has been starting, especially around the COVID-19 uh, related lockdowns because it became more difficult for all drug users that were already um, in treatment or accessing counseling to have that access. And there were about 130 um, professionals that had been trained by UNODC. And they came together, they volunteered, and they created essentially this network of drug counselors that were providing now over-the-phone assistance. And this is something that I think we need now to build on. We need to have a national drug helpline and this is something that we're trying very hard to work with our counterparts in government to, to achieve. I, I want to assume, Mr. Stop, here, that uh, the reasons for drug use would vary from country to country. Um, what can we trace? Because, I mean, you've talked about how difficult it has been to achieve that third leg of preventing drug use. Perhaps if people knew why the problem started and has grown over the years, perhaps that might be a good, a, good, a good place to start because if there is no impetus for drug use, there would probably be less drug use in the country and consequently be able to drive down the, the need you know, for use of drug. What is it, especially in Nigeria, maybe you may want to draw examples from other nations as well, that makes people take drugs? Well, there's no one specific reason. We need to be very clear that makes people use drugs. There might be some biological preconditions that make people more susceptible to the use of drugs and more susceptible to becoming addicts. But across all nations, we are facing a world drug problem. So it's nothing that is specific to Nigeria. Some of the reasons that are at work in Nigeria are specific indeed. They are shared by other African nations, by other developing countries. First of all, of course, we have the general issue that we find in particular amongst our young populations, which is simply curiosity. But beyond that, we have specific factors in Nigeria. For example, the hardships that many young people face. For example, if I'm in university and my university closes down about half of my educational period, I'm condemned to idleness and that is obviously a period where I'm becoming very susceptible to deal with that stress, to cope with it, um, to, to start using drugs. Also economic hardship, simple escapism we will f uh, very often see and there is also the very harsh conditions of work that some of our citizens are facing in Nigeria that actually makes them to use drugs simply to get it through the day. There's a very interesting documentary that was done last year for the World Drug Day in which a commercial sex worker basically reported that if she takes no drugs, she can satisfy seven clients and if she takes tramadol she can have up to 15 clients and so it becomes an economic decision for her to essentially get her job if you want to call it a job done and of course the, the effects are horrific um, on, on her health on her well-being and on her opportunities um, to, to, to get her life in order. Well, you have talked about how difficult, I mean, the three-pronged approach. And you assume that right now we're doing well on one of the prongs, which is, I don't know what to say if it's prevention or, but there's a crackdown. I don't know where that fits in, in, on, on the tripod. Uh, but in terms of getting help, how high is it a priority from what you have seen? Uh, is this something that we have invested quite a bit of money in or do we need help in that area? Well, first of all, the, the crackdown, mm -hmm. uh, that one I would put into the enforcement area. 
And that is very important. That is a traditional area of intervention for UNODC. This is where our partnership with NDLEA is really at work. We have trained thousands of NDLEA and customs officers in the skills of how to interdict drugs, how to conduct intelligence-led operations, how to conduct financial investigations, how to prosecute effectively, and so on and so forth. And I'm sure you must be really proud right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly it is very encouraging to see how these um, skills that we have helped to build seem now to be really put at work. Yeah. Now, in the terms of the treatment side, I think we definitely need more investment. I think we need to come together as the international community, individual philanthropists and the private sector to make a significant investment in this area. Because if we are estimating roughly that we have around close to 3 million people living with a drug use disorder, and we have probably only around a thousand plus or minus treatment facility um, capacity, then we see the gap is massive and more needs to be done. And that is, of course, an investment that first and foremost needs to be done by the Federal Ministry of Health, the Nigerian government. But others need to come uh, to help as well. It's a fine place to leave it. Thank you so much for the work that you do and thank you for coming on Sunrise Daily this morning. Thank you so much for having me. Dr. Oliver Stolpe is a country representative, United Nations Office on Drug and Crime, that's the UNODC. And we're talking about the drug problem ahead of World Drug Day. Please stay with us. Sunrise Daily will be back.